الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد Welcome to the Friday حلقة at Abu Huraira Center in Toronto, Canada <coughs> So we, all, we are still taking a thematic journey through the Quran and we reached Surah Al-Ra'd Surah of Thunder uh, We dealt last week, we finished with Surah Yusuf alayhi salam <coughs> and we took some of the lessons from the story and uh, we saw how um, the whole surah was more of a consolation and, and moral support to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the believers at all times when they face trials and uh, when things like the way life goes doesn't seem to be very um, uh, so much in line with our you know with what we desire but again it just takes us deep into being content with what Allah writes for us because that's eventually good uh, for us. Surah Al-Ra'd has the concept of truth in it and how the truth is evident in revelation and in the creation. So the, the concept of truth is heavily present in the surah and it points to uh, signs uh, that show us the truth in the revelation of Allah, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine words of the Quran, and also in the creation, which is the handiwork of Allah uh, ta'ala. Uh, and um, the, verse, uh, the first verse in the surah is quite telling about this theme, about the central theme. Uh, so the surah starts, A'udhu billahi wa shaitan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, alif la mim ra. تلك آيات الكتاب والذي أنزل إليك من ربك الحق ولكن أكثر الناس لا يؤمنون ألف لام ميم را These are the signs, the verses of the book and what was revealed to you from your Lord is the truth but most people do not believe and that would be the supportive theme which shows that people are not the majority of people would reject the truth even when it has become evident to them. Uh, in the surah, there's a lot of mention of natural phenomena, the things that we see in nature around us, and the, the, the they are used or they are utilized to point to the might and power of Allah and to the fact that the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a wise purpose. And that we should not look at natural phenomena just as natural phenomena, something that exists. But we should look at it, uh, look at anything in the world as a pointer that leads us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the, the, uh, one of the most prevalent messages in Surah Al-Ra'd. Thus it was named Al-Ra'd. Allah even points out that this natural phenomena, like uh, thunder, rain, etc., these are actually, uh, these are acts of worship, acts of devotion, acts of love from the creation to, the, to their Lord. Uh, so we're going to see that, inshallah, today. Hopefully, bi'ithnillah, we will be able to cover Surah Al-Ra'd today, all of it. And it's one of these profound surahs where the aqeedah aqid is very present and strong. So in the first page, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention to natural phenomena and how it was Allah who put them in place. And all of that implies purpose. Allah draws our attention to the fact that this world was purposely put together to serve one purpose. And that purpose is that to help you find the truth, recognize the truth and follow it and worship your Lord. Uh, so Allah mentions that he's the one who raised the heavens without pillars visible to you. Uh, and Allah talks about himself that he rose above the throne and how he put the sun and the moon in these uh, to serve a specific purpose that Allah created them for and that they follow their prescribed course. Then Allah shows that don't think this is all running on its own. It's not automatic. <laughs> this is the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in place. Uh, so Allah says at the end of verse 2, يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرَ Allah manages all of the efforts. And he clarifies in detail all of the signs. He devises the signs for you so that you may grow certain 
and you may arrive at a point of belief in meeting your Lord. So everything is in place to serve one thing, to help you recognize your Lord, acknowledge him, worship him, uh, be certain of meeting him and returning to him and getting ready for that. This is the purpose behind everything that you see in the world. Then Allah points to how he made the earth, uh, in a sense, uh, more of a extended, so we can travel through it, we can utilize it, we can make use of it, and that he established mountains to make it stable, rivers, and Allah caused fruits and vegetables to grow of every kind in pairs. And then Allah refers to the night and the day and the, alter, uh, the alternation between them. Allah says in all of this, there are signs for people who use their intellect correctly. So again, there is a relationship between nature and our intellect, humans. Uh, if, if without negative influence on our minds and our thinking process, the natural world would lead us to Allah subhanahu then Allah points again to the earth, how he created the earth, different types of soil and land, and that there are gardens of different types of fruits, uh, grapes, uh, dates, others, etc. And how the variety of the vegetation and the fruits that come out of the earth, although they are being fed with the same soil and the same water. And Allah says, and we make some of those blessings better than others. So they are grades, they are levels. Allah says, there is also signs in these for people, uh, people of reason. Then Allah points to how amazing, you know, those who disbelieve, you know, uh, how, how, how their logic is just, that doesn't really make any sense. It's a, it's a source of wonder, like, they, they are denying that there will be creation again, that they will be brought back to life again. So since life was brought the first time, one, why makes you doubt the second time? Again, so there's no logical argument here. But Allah SWT says those people who insist on this disbelief, they will be chained and they will be uh, taken to the hellfire. Then Allah responds to some of their arguments where they try to deny Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala his existence. They try to strike some parables, use their own twisted logic, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to that. They ask the Prophet ﷺ for signs to prove. And Allah says, you know, O oh Messenger, you are just someone who conveys and the message and you warn, it's Allah who guides. It's not about signs. And these people's problem is not with signs. It's actually with something else. It's with their attitude. Allah points to his own knowledge, his divine foreknowledge, knowing everything. So Allah says he knows what every woman will carry in her womb, even before that happens. Uh, and whatever happens in, you know, takes place in the womb, all the stages, all the details, and much more than that. And Allah says, وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَهُ بِمِقْدَارِ This is verse number eight. Everything is designed according to a precise measure. That's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing random. Uh, there's nothing haphazard. Everything is very well designed. Everything is part of an intricate, detailed, wise plan. And everything is serving a purpose. Uh, he knows the unseen and he knows everything. And he is the mighty, the powerful, and the most high. Then Allah knows everything, whether you conceal it or you reveal it. Allah knows about it. Allah knows what's in the darkness and what's in the light. And he also has angels protecting you, taking care of you. You think you're just running on your own and, uh, and that your safety is a given. It's basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending guarding angels to protect you from anything that uh, could harm you, which is not written for you, or from anything that caused you to die, which is not written for you as well. Um, so there's an emphasis on the might and power of Allah. Then Allah points here again to natural phenomena, like uh, uh, like lightning, for example. He says, he's the one who shows you the lightning. And lightning causes you hope for rain and also fear, fear of a storm, right? And destruction. And he's the one who builds and establishes these huge, gigantic uh, 
clouds that cause rain. And Allah says, وَيُسَبِّحُ الرَّعْدُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ مِنْ خِيفَتِهِ Thunder is actually praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the natural world doing what it's created for. It's actually worshipping Allah. And although it serves a purpose or a service, offers a service to humanity, but it's also in its own right, it is doing what it's created for. And that's worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole world actually speaks the language of worship of Allah and love of Allah, except for humans and jinn who are giving the choice. Uh, and Allah says, the angels celebrate Allah and they fear him. And Allah sends storms with which he hits certain people and he protects some people uh, from them. And people still, despite the might and power of Allah, they still argue about his existence and about even his right to be worshipped. And Allah, Allah here establishes that the only the, the call to worship Allah alone is the only true call. Anything else is falsehood. Anything else is falsehood. And those who do not respond to this call, to this divine call, and which resonates with their very nature, which is actually part of who they are deep inside, that's the fitrah. Those who do not, do not respond to this, those are, Allah gives an analogy, a very powerful analogy. He says, these people are expecting what they want from a place where these things don't belong. And the analogy Allah gives here is just like someone who's trying to drink from a pond of water by just extending his hand to the water and expect, expecting the water to come to their mouth, to jump to their mouth. So Allah is saying those who want a good life, those who want safety, those who want to live a good life by worshipping other than Allah, they're just seeking that purpose from uh, from a place, from a source that does not have it. The same thing, similar to people who are trying to get the water to jump right into their mouth. That's not how you drink water. And Allah says that everything in the heavens and the earth actually prostrates before Allah, worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. And there's an argument against the those who disbelieve in Allah, those who associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the argument is basically about who's the Lord of the worlds, of the world, who created the world, who created the heavens and the earth. And, and the Arabs used to recognize that it was Allah. So the logical conclusion, how come you worship others besides Allah? He is the Lord, he's a Rabb, and that means he's the Ilah, he's the only God, the only ones who deserves to be worshipped. So where are your minds? Why are you going to worship something else? So that's a very, it's a very straightforward and very powerful and compelling argument. And then Allah SWT also compares himself, just for the sake of argument, to their idols, to their objects of worship. Like, what do you worship? Stones, sun, moon, animals, whatever. That's blind compared to Allah who sees everything, who knows everything, who who is the almighty. Yeah, so there is this, this argument, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, approaches this argument from different angles, but eventually it's just to let people think and reflect. Uh, hopefully this would wake them up to the truth of their existence. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises, he says, those who respond to Allah, they will get the best reward, they will get paradise. And those who do not respond to Allah positively, on the day of judgment, even if they have all of the earth, all of the pleasures and the treasures of the earth, of this world together, and the like of it on top of that, in order to rescue themselves from the hellfire, they would actually try to ransom, they would, they would give up on everything just to protect themselves from the hellfire. But they will not be able to get out of the hellfire because they were given the chance. They were asked for way less than that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then afterwards praises those who respond positively to Allah. So Allah says, are the ones who believe, who know and believe in what was sent to you, to your Lord, like those who are blind. And this shows that blindness is blindness of the heart. Um, and those who reject, deliberately reject faith and truth after it has become clear to them, those people are blind in their heart. They insist not to see the truth and to reject the truth. Then Allah praises those who believe that they are people of understanding. They are the ones who remain truthful to the covenant they have with Allah. It's the natural covenant, natural agreement, the fitrah. 
it's human nature in its essence, in its most pristine form. And they do not break this agreement with Allah. And they are the ones who connect what Allah commanded to be connected. And they are the ones who fear Allah and are afraid of his, of their account turning out to be, you know, one that is bad, one that is uh, marred with sin and disobedience. And they are the ones who are patient for the sake of the face of their Lord. And this shows that this life is going to have its challenges and we will definitely need patience. We need patience in the face of predicaments and hardships and challenges. We we'll need patience to remain upon guidance and upon obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the nafs is impatient. And we also need patience to resist the temptations. And they are the ones who establish the prayer and pay, you know, give from what Allah uh, provided for them. They give in secret and in public because each one has its own merit. And they repel, they respond to evil with good. For these people will be the best of uh, destinations. It will be the gardens of Aden, Jannah to Aden. They would enter them and whoever is righteous among their fathers and their progeny and their wives, their spouses. And the angels would be entering upon them from every gate. And they would be saying to them, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Peace be upon you because of the patience you had. And this shows that the path to Jannah requires patience being able to navigate the waters of this life requires a lot of patience to remain upon the truth and that means the temptations will be powerful the distractions will be uh, intense uh, the difficulties will be quite abundant all of that requires patience to remain steadfast then Allah compares this to those who actually uh, break their covenant, the natural covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how this reflects on their actions. Their actions are not going to be good. And for those people, there will be curse of Allah and there will be the, the worst of abodes. Allah then clarifies how he is the one who provides according to a precise measure as well. Then Allah returns to uh, some of the arguments of the people of disbelief. Uh, because they claim that if we had a sign, if you showed us a sign, we would actually believe. But Allah says, you know, no, belief is in the hands of Allah. A guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, it's in the hands of Allah doesn't mean it's random. Just Allah guides those who truly seek the truth, who are sincere in seeking the truth. There's a couple of beautiful verses here that are very famous from Surah Al-Rad. Allah says, refers to those who are guided. Who are the ones who are guided? In verse number 28, Allah says, Those who have believed and their hearts find peace and tranquility upon the mention of the name of Allah, upon the remembrance of Allah. Indeed, with the, with the mention of Allah, the hearts find tranquility. And this shows that uh, believing in Allah, connecting to Allah is the natural state. And it's what the heart is created for. So it enjoys it. It feels at peace. It's at, it, it becomes, it reaches its best when it's done, when it does what it was created for. That's what the heart is for. But if the heart is dead, it does not obviously recognize that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa how previous, you know, uh, messengers received this kind of resistance and how even if Allah shows them signs, powerful signs, like if Allah brings down a Quran that moves mountains and cuts the earth and would uh, get the dead to speak, those people would not believe. It's not about miracles. It's not about science. It's, it, it, it has to do with something. What was given was enough. So it has to do with their attitude and their choice not to believe in Allah subhanahu uh, so there's a reference to how previous prophets and messengers were dealt with by their people. There is a, a few points again pointing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, his, his power and his care, how he takes care of his creation. Uh, there is a, a reference to paradise, how its rivers flow and the food and provision in it is permanent and how its shade is beautiful and permanent. 
Um, there's a reference to the Quran and how it contains the truth. Again, we said the whole surah is about the truth. So a lot of this uh, previous, uh, these previous pages from the surah were, there's a heavy reference to the natural world and how it carries the message of the truth. And then there's a reference to human nature and how it actually harbors the seeds of the truth in it and how disbelievers actually are rebelling against the human nature. And now there is an emphasis towards the end of the surah on the fact that the revelation that came from Allah also harbors the uh, the truth. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it in Arabic. Um, and how prophets and messengers were sent. They had wives, they had children. That's because one. this was one of the objections against Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that he should have been an angel or something like that. Uh, yeah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calms down Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and just uh, indicates to him that people, uh, I mean, people, good people will be guided eventually. And those who reject the truth, no matter what signs you bring them, whatever you do, they will not believe. So what Allah wrote 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth as to who will be guided and who will be misguided will actually come true because what Allah wrote down was based on his foreknowledge of everything. Then Allah concludes the surah by uh, indicating his power and might and that no matter how, how they plot and conspire, uh, the plan of Allah is way more powerful and it's going to dominate and the end will be for those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Prophet ﷺ in the last verse as uh, the disbelievers uh, challenge his messages and they say Yo, you're not a messenger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him say to them you know Allah is sufficient as a witness between me and you I'm not seeking your approval here or your recognition it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient and he is he will be the judge between us and those who have knowledge of previous scriptures of the book if they are sincere they know this is the truth they recognize it uh, so again so the surah is the concept of truth is heavily present throughout the surah uh, and uh, we have these I would say three sources where you find the truth heavily present it's the same kind of truth so it's coming at humans from three directions first from within themselves from the, their very nature the fitrah it's the natural covenant with allah and second it comes at them from the natural world around them everything screams the name of allah and the oneness of allah so points to the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his, and his right to be worshipped and everything is actually worshipping allah and Third, it's uh, the revelation, the divine word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and the guidance that he gave to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of this points again to the truth of this message in the Quran that no one should be worshipped but Allah and this life is all about humans uh, worshipping Allah, being obedient to him, being dutiful towards him and fulfilling the purpose of their creation. So uh, with this, uh, we sort of had a, a very quick thematic, you know, skim through Surah Al-Ra'id, which is a very profound and beautiful Surah. I'd recommend you actually read it uh, if you have time after this halaqa, and you will see how profound and powerful it is. Find the language there to be very powerful, very captivating, and very poetic, by the way. So this is one of, in my experience, is one of the most melodious you know, surahs in the Quran. Somehow it just, the way it rhymes, the way it its words are arranged and the way they sound, it's just so powerful and beautiful. And maybe there's a connection because it's called thunder and thunder is about, it's a sound. So there is something there very special about Surat al rad Okay, so I think this is enough for today, inshallah ta'ala. Next week, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we will be dealing with, or we'll be going through Surah Ibrahim, which is Surah number 14 in the Quran. Jazakumullah khairan for joining us. And again, I hope you guys are keeping safe, uh, taking care of yourself and your families. Uh, see you next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.